Okay, um, good uh, morning. Uh, I am delighted to be here. I want to thank the Humphrey Fellow Program for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to meet future leaders, especially when they can still be led, um, and when you can have their autograph for a much lower rate. Um, I am going to echo some of what Mark has said before. A lot of the themes that he touched upon are actually things that I want to say as well. And there are two themes in particular that I will be covering, uh, but hopefully with a slightly uh, different angle. And the angle that I bring to the conversation is the angle of somebody who has a foot in academia. I teach in some of these um, questions regarding uh, MDGs, even though we may not call them MDGs, uh, questions of education, questions re re related to poverty, um, questions related to demography, uh, child mortality, uh, maternal mortality, and so forth. So I have one foot in academia. I have one foot in policy. In the last six years, I've been involved with a group that tries to um, work with local policymakers in Africa to um, think about this very question that we're addressing here. And so one foot in academia, one foot in policy, and I think I have one, a third foot in uh, the real world. Uh, I come from Africa, and uh, I have my personal <coughs> programs to uh, address MDGs, my own MDGs within my extended family, within my, neighbor, my neighborhood, my villages, uh, trying to reduce poverty, um, prevent maternal mortality, and so forth. So I bring a perspective that is slightly different. Now, I said there are common themes that we address. One common theme that Mark addressed and that I'm going to return to because it's a central theme to what I, well, pretty much everything I do is uh, inequality. I think this is a question that has not sufficiently been addressed in the MDGs, and I'm glad to see that it's gaining more traction in the next round, and hopefully, I hope it does. Uh, and the first, the other theme that I want to address uh, is sort of the black and white picture. Uh, the notion that when you look at the MDGs, there have been uh, many successes, and there have been quite a few failures, okay? And so what I want to ask as a question is what you have there as the front title, why do MDGs fail? Uh, when we occasionally fail to either reduce poverty or to reduce uh, maternal mortality, why? And what lesson can we draw for the future? Okay, and as a subtitle, I have something that hopefully doesn't make sense to anybody, uh, but at the same time, I hope it's going to make sense by the time we are done. Why do MDGs fail? Okay, I'm going to argue um, through this talk that MDGs fail for a variety of reasons, but one reason in particular is fundamentally important and is almost a conceptual reason is that there, there's a subtle disconnect. There's a subtle tension between two ways to think about development and to think about MDGs. The first way that I'm going to represent here on your screen is a an approach in which we tend to think about development mostly in terms of macroeconomic growth, having countries as the unit of analysis, and the concern here is trying to, bo to boost economic growth as a whole. That's the main goal. That's how we think about development. Doesn't mean that we're not concerned about the rest, um, that is the uh, basic needs, social well-being, and so forth, but basically the assumption the presumption is that those basic needs are going to flow directly from economic growth. And so the order of business, the order of priority is macroeconomic growth. And this view is what you're likely to find among mainstream economists at the World Bank or among finance ministers in many countries that are implementing um, the MDGs. Okay. And this is the view that I'm going to call in the particular context of sub-Saharan Africa the lion's share, lion with a big L and lion plural. What this means here is that people are concerned about the lions as a whole, meaning African countries, by comparison with the Asian tigers, get to the point where they emerge and they become middle income countries. So the goal here is to bring the entire region, the entire continent forward as a whole and to raise its growth uh, and its GDP per capita. That's the first understanding of development. 
Next to this, you have a different approach in which the concern here is about the bottom line of social well-being. We, of course, assume that nations are a relevant unit of analysis, but we also understand that there are differences within nations. There's heterogeneity within nations, and we have to pay attention to questions of distribution and inequality because they're not automatically resolved. Okay? So this is in opposition to the first view that we had. In this view, you tend to see this within the United Nations and NGOs. And this here I call the lion's share, lion with a little l and lion singular, meaning here we are trying to pay attention to who gets what share of the growth. The issue is not just growth, but how growth is distributed. And the point I'm going to make through the talk is that as we think, as we conceive MDGs, the implicit framing, the implicit understanding has been what we have on your left, which is we're thinking about improving well-being for the least, uh, uh, the, the, the least privilege of citizens, all the goals that you can think of, reducing poverty, uh, reducing maternal mortality, improving uh, basic education, etc. These are goals that mostly target the most um, poor segments of the society. Okay? These goals have pretty much the poor in mind. Whereas when we execute the MDGs, the finance minister are mostly interested in boosting economic growth. And if you have this disconnect, between the goals that we envision and the goals that are executed, you end up with an odd situation where you can actually have a successful execution, but you don't meet the goals because the execution is not following the same paradigm, the same viewpoint, the same understanding of development that, uh, framed, that was used to frame the MDGs. Okay. So that's the idea I'm going to uh, push through this presentation. This goal here, just for sake of argument, I'm going to call consensus. And this goal to the left, I'm going to call conflict. Okay. Now, I'm going to organize my presentation around three main points. The first point is that, as Mark said, MDGs have not been entirely successful. They have been successful in part, but they also have been places where they have not been uh, entirely successful. And so, this is from a scientific standpoint, a good situation because we can learn from this selective success. If you are successful all the time, you don't learn anything. If you are never successful, you can't learn anything either. So the best time, the best opportunity to learn is when you are successful some of the times and when you fail some of the times because you can compare situations where you succeed and situations where you fail and see what is the common trait between those, the, those situations where you succeed and what is missing when you fail. And this is true whether you're talking about the goals that we have here as MDGs, the goals of a nation, or even if you're talking about personal goals. And so I'm going to, in this section, draw from an example that all of us know very well, a set of personal goals, um, and I'm going to extract lessons from our own lives, our personal goals. Most of us here set goals and sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. What is present when we succeed and what is missing when we fail? And I'm going to extract from this basic lesson and, and uh, to think about the conditions under which we are likely to succeed in meeting MDGs. And finally, I'm going to conclude, and my bottom line is that for the MDGs, or what is going to follow to succeed, there has to be a bit of a bridging between these two conceptions of development that I talked about. Um, that is, pay greater attention to inequality in addition to growth, pay attention to the lion's share with the little n, in addition to the lion's share with the capital L. So this is the, the big story. Now, first thing, the MDGs have been selectively successful. Uh, this is just as we have a background and some of these ideas Mark has talked about already. Uh, there's been selective success, <clears throat> whether you look 
across regions. Uh, these are different broad regions of the world, and you can contrast China, for instance, Eastern Asia, and China only uh, segment with Sub-Saharan Africa. One has widely exceeded the goals, the other uh, has not met um, a substantial um, percentage of the goal that it set itself. So there's been quite um, uh, some variation in the extent to which different world regions have met their goals. The same variation you'll find if you look across individual countries. These are countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And here you have a composite indicator that has been built by the Center for Global Development in, in Washington. And what they've done is just have a compilation of the extent to which uh, countries have met each of the eight goals, and each goal gets you a point of one. So potentially you can have a score ranging from zero to eight, depending on how many goals you've, 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 you've met. Um, and so as you can see here, African countries run the gamut. There are some at the bottom that have met barely uh, a goal, and there are some at the very top that have uh, reached a score of six. So tremendous variation within, um, across African countries. The same is true whether you look within country now, so inside of country, and here I took uh, Nigeria as an example. And infant mortality as an example and just show the differences that you find in the rates of infant mortality rate depending on where people fit in the socioeconomic structure. And so you can see rates of infant mortality are 2.5 times higher among the top 20% of the population compared to the rates that you find, I mean, are lower, the top 20% the top uh, compared to rates that you find among the poor. So there's great disparities um, within the same country. And the example I gave here for in, uh, infant mortality, you can take other goals and the picture would be fairly similar. Now there's also selective success across the goals themselves. Uh, if you take each of the eight goals, again as Mark um, sort of indicated in passing, uh, and here I bring my um, professor hat, if we were to score these goals, um, for some of the goals, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa would get a straight F, uh, and poverty reduction would be one of them. Um, gender equality in tertiary education would be <coughs> another one. But in some other goals, they may get a little bit better, all the way to a B or even a B plus. So depending on which goal you're looking at, um, the outcome is also slightly, I mean, not slightly, quite dramatically different. Okay, so selective success across regions, across countries, within countries, and across goals. And so the question is, what do we learn from this varied success? What are the conditions under which countries succeed? What are the goals on which we are likely to succeed? And here, what I wanted to do is to take a page from our personal lives, as opposed to stay with the aggregate big uh, goals from MDGs, our personal lives are more amenable to understanding because we turn back to something that we know fairly well. Okay. And so if we think about goals that we set, every January 1st, many of us in this room decided that from now on we're going to be a better person and we pull out our pen and our notepad and write a long list of resolutions that we're going to meet for that year. And here is a list of some of the resolutions that, at least in the American public, most people are likely to make on January 1st. Um, you're going to lose weight, get organized, spend less, save more, blah, 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 blah. Um, and for those who decided that uh, their new year was going to be spent learning something exciting, um, keep looking because this class is not, is not going to do it. Um, um, but by mid-June, um, well, we are kind of losing steam. Uh, our resolve is fading and so forth. And by the end of the year, according to one estimate that I saw in a, a recently published study, uh, well, 92% of us have failed. Okay, 92% of the goals have gone down the drain. 
and we wait for the next year to set new goals and, and get started. Just like the UN is waiting for 2015 uh, to set new goals, all right? Um, and so the question is why do we have this 92% failure rate? What are the reasons? And so from a literature, you get three clusters of reasons why these failures happen. One is that the goals that you set may be too high, okay? Um, if you decide that you're going to lose 100 pounds, maybe there are people on TV who lose 100 pounds, but uh, chances are you're probably not going to do it. If you set a bar that is too low, then it's not challenging enough and you may be discouraged as well. So setting the right challenge for you, and I'm glad again that the UN has embraced this flexible uh, grid, uh, which actually might make it um, a little bit easier for countries to sustain interest and believe uh, in um, and set goals that they can actually achieve. And I'm going to show examples of goals that may be high, um, uh, unwittingly high um, uh, later. Now, the second reason is that the goals may be too proximate. And what I mean by this is that the goals are not an end in themselves. Uh, you set a goal, but it's not really the thing that you are after. You decide to lose weight, but why are you trying to lose weight? Uh, losing weight is not going to make you necessarily a happier person or more fulfilled person, so you still need to reach the end behind the goal that you set. And so we have to think about the end at the same time as we're thinking about the goal. And again, I'm going to show you an example uh, uh, in the case of MDGs. And then the last is that uh, very often the goals are not critical enough. Um, that is, very often we tend to think in uh, uh, non-zero-sum terms in which just we can get things without losing anything. What do we lose by deciding to pursue one goal? What gets lost in the shuffle? You decide to lose weight, well, what do you have to sacrifice? You need, presumably, more time to spend at the gym. This is time that you could have spent in your, with your family or reading a book or doing something else. Um, what is getting lost, okay? Is there a tension between goals? Is there a tension when we think about countries within different segments of the population, okay? We have to think about those tensions, and that's the point here. Now, let me try to illustrate these three points in the case of MDGs. Now, Setting goals that are too high, okay, and I wish here I had a pointer. Um, let's, this is Nigeria's situation, and this is kind of unwittingly. This is Nigeria. Um, can, can I have somebody at the, at the, okay. I don't have a pointer, who's just going to, oh, very nice, excellent, thank you. You saved the day, okay. So this is the, where Nigeria was in terms of its uh, poverty rate um, when you started the Millennium Development Agenda. And, the, and therefore, to Nigeria, to be on course, you had a trajectory like this, okay? So the country should be here. Just forget about the meaning of the red. I'm, 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 um, I'm going to explain. I just changed this a little bit. So this is a trajectory that you expected Nigeria to take if it's to meet the goal of reducing poverty according to the target that was set. And so what you think the effort should be is this much. Nigeria should by, you know, five years later, should have reduced poverty by this much. But this is an important fallacy here. The assumption is that if you hadn't done anything, the poverty rate would have remained the same. But that's not necessarily true. The truth is the poverty rate would have probably risen. Why? Because of what um, uh, Marx said, sort of in, in implicitly, is because you have population growth and you have differential population growth. In many countries in Africa, the poor have higher fertility than the higher ranks of population. And if you don't assume a tremendous amount of mobility, economic mobility, social mobility, the poverty rate is expected to keep going. And so the effort that you're actually asking this country to make is this much. And so when Nigeria you know, happens to be here, the tendency is to assume that they really didn't do much, whereas in fact they did a tremendous amount of 
pushing. Okay. So that's one point I wanted to drive home in terms of goals being ha uh, too high and really understanding the magnitude of the effort that was accomplished. Now, the goals can also be too proximate. Uh, if you think about the goal of uh, reducing the number of people living under $1.25 a day, um, well, that's the goal. But presumably, what we want these people to be is to be fulfilled, to be happy, to be content, to uh, not feel stressed anymore about thinking where the next meal is going to come from. Right? That's the end. This is just the mean. The, the $1.25 is just the mean. And much has been done, uh, if you, those of you who are interested in, in research on the connection between income and happiness and fulfillment and lack of stress, there's this sort of curve by which they say essentially money makes you happy. So the more money you get, the happier you are, but until a certain point where things kind of taper off. Uh, money doesn't make a difference anymore. Except they've been paying attention to the lower end of this distribution. Now, if you think about the other case at the sort of very poor end, where this $1 per day, $1.25 per day are, maybe the curve is also flat, meaning that moving from 0 0.5 to $2 really doesn't make a marginal difference that is going to be significant to make you any happier. So reaching the 125 mark does it really make a difference? I don't know. I go to Africa very often, and very often I try my best, as I told you, I have my personal MDG goals to try to achieve within the family, and I have yet to meet a poor person who just, after you guarantee them a $1 per day uh, existence, start doing backflips and somersault and say, you know, I'm set from now on, I'm not going to want anything else in life. So, one dollar a day is a target, but it's not an end, and we have to keep that in mind. Okay, so the goal here is proximate, it's not the end. Then, also we can be, uh, the goals can be uncritical, in the sense that, well, we forget to pay attention to um, the uh, tension between goals and the tension between members of the same society. Um, again, if we still focus on the goal of reducing the number of people living under a dollar per day, um, we tend to assume that this goal is going to be addressed if we just promote economic growth. If the country grows economically, this is going to be addressed. And this is, again, a fallacy. Uh, and I'm going to show you why in the case of African countries. This, is, this map here shows the economic growth within Africa in the last 10 uh, decades. In green, you have countries that have positive growth. Dark green is countries that had really positive growth. Uh, you do have a few countries that are in red, and these are countries that were having negative growth. But the story here is that Africa has done extremely well in the last 10 years. This is a well-known fact, economically, in terms of economic growth, in terms of GDP per capita. And so, Therefore, you have to deal with the paradox that I have implicitly underlined. That is, in terms of poverty reduction, Africa gets an F. But in terms of economic performance, it gets a good score. And again, it has to do with the tension between the MDGs and the vision of development that they uh, build upon and the um, focus on economic growth, the average improvement in GDP per capita. They're not the same thing. Okay? So we have to pay attention to the factors, the specific factors that drive poverty reduction besides <coughs> growth. Okay, they are competing interests within the same country. Poverty is not going to be reduced just because you achieve economic growth. It depends on the poor ability to make claims on the system as well. Okay. And this is more or less uh, result from a student of mine, she's in the class, I don't, Jessica Horse, uh, I want to acknowledge her. Uh, she essentially is working on her honest thesis, and she basically tried to chart the relationship between um, progress in reducing MDGs 
and progress in economic growth. And you can see that even though there's sort of a, a relation um, in the direction we expect, this relation is fairly tenuous. It's a very, very loose relationship. It's not a strong relationship. Not only is not a strong relationship, but the factors that drive this relationship, these two relationships may be different. And so what she did is she, she took classic variables that we expect to promote economic growth, um, things such as um, um, education, things such as uh, uh, natural resources, things such as um, sort of age structure, uh, low age dependency. These factors here are, are supposed to, re to, to, to promote economic growth, economic GDP per capita. But when you look at their relationship with MDGs, it's actually the opposite of what you expect. And so the factors that drive economic growth are not necessarily the same that are going to drive success in MDGs. And we have to consider the real possibility that the two are different. Okay? Not just in terms of their trends, but also in terms of the policies that are going to drive one versus the other. Okay. And so this is basically what I wanted to say. And to summarize my, um, um, uh, my bottom line here is that in the specific con uh, context of Africa, and again, I'm glad that this is emerging in the new agenda. Hopefully it is going to be in the new agenda. It's important to pay attention to inequality, to d matters of distribution, in addition to promoting economic growth. Why? Because number one, Inequality is already fairly high in Africa. That is something that is not um, uh, sufficiently discussed. The map here shows the levels of inequality across the world with the US as a reference. Okay. So countries that are in red are countries where the levels of internal inequality are higher than the levels that you have here in the US and countries that are in blue a country where the levels of inequality are less. And you can see that quite a number of countries in Africa have levels of inequality that are higher than the levels of inequality that you observe today in the US. And if you know that the US today is complaining about having historically high inequality levels, that suggests that there are many countries that have very, very high levels of inequality. And this is something that needs to be addressed. But things could actually get worse. Things could get worse for many reasons, but I'm just going to show you one. This is the difference in sort of the idea here is that the inequality that you're going to have tomorrow is in large measure a byproduct of the inequalities that you have today among children. And so if you look at the relationship between the number of children that the poor versus the rich have, in African countries. In red, you have the number of children per woman among the rich. And in blue, you have the number of children per woman among the bottom 25% of the population. And so you can see in countries like Liberia, there's just an enormous difference in birth rates. Okay? Uh, people who have um, very little money to begin with, uh, very little money to begin with, have the highest birth rates. As, as, as much as eight children per, per woman. And those who have more have um, fewer kids. Now, if you add this factor to just the differences in income already and differences in access, uh, we were talking about transparency and, 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 uh, and social capital and questions of, of, of corruption, then it means that within the current generation of children, you have vast amounts of inequality. And these inequalities are likely to feed inequality in the future. So that's another reason why I would suggest, again, to pay attention to inequality in the future. And so my lessons or messages, parting messages for the post-2015 um, um, agenda are as follows. Okay? Pay attention to inequality, pursue growth, but really give serious attention to questions of distribution. Uh, and to uh, address this question of inequality, there are um, demographic forces that are actually pushing inequality. I talked about fertility. There are also things happening with family structure, as well as social forces such as 
informal, uh, formal systems of redistribution. Many African countries have relied on informal systems of redistribution that are kind of weakening, and they need to be replaced or complemented by a more formal system of redistribution. And then finally, um, reinforce um, the ability, the mechanisms that the poor have to make claims on the system. Thank you very much.